welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. This playlist that we're beginning here is going to be starting a study of the endocrine system. So the endocrine system is one of the two major control systems of the body, the other one being the nervous system. The nervous system, say the brain, controls the body through electrical impulses. In contrast, the endocrine system is going to control through a very different mechanism, and that is the production and release of hormones. So hormones are just molecules, and they come in a variety of different types. They can be large proteins, small peptides of literally just three amino acids, or anywhere in between, and then they can also be other types of molecules derived from amino acids, and they are very diverse. But in general, hormones are all going to function in the same way. They're going to be released by a tissue called a gland. So here's an example gland right here that we're going to cover in several videos. This is actually the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland is situated actually anterior to your trachea. It's actually in your neck region. And the thyroid gland is going to synthesize hormones, just like any other gland. And when those hormones are synthesized under the proper stimulus, they are released into the blood. And this is a very important definition of hormones. Hormones are chemical messengers that travel in the blood, and they travel to target tissues, and they exert some biological effect. Endocrine glands, part of the endocrine system, are different than exocrine glands. All the way back in ANP1, we discussed exocrine glands. Those are glands that release some substance onto a body's surface. Okay? So for example, your sweat glands, that's probably the best example, a sudoriferous gland or eccrine sweat gland. They release sweat onto the surface of your skin. Are they releasing it into the blood? No. Therefore, the sweat gland is an exocrine gland. Endocrine glands release hormones into the blood. So everything we talk about from here on out, if it's a hormone, it was made by some endocrine gland and released into the blood. So hopefully that makes sense to you. But when we talk about these hormones, we're going to see that there's two different classes of hormones, and they're going to function differently. And the two major classes are the water-soluble hormones and lipid-soluble hormones. And the way they function has to do with whether or not they can cross the plasma membrane of a cell. Because in order to cause an effect on a target tissue after the hormones released into the blood, it's going to have to go to a target tissue and somehow cause an effect on the inside of the cell. Okay? So how the hormone functions depends on whether or not it can cross the membrane into the inside of the target cell. We're going to begin our study here with water-soluble hormones. Now, what does it mean to be water-soluble? It means that the molecule is hydrophilic, which generally means it's polar or charged. Now, polar and charged molecules are soluble in water, and since the blood is mostly water, they're soluble in the blood. However, the plasma membrane shown right here is mostly lipid. So do you think a water-soluble substance is going to be able to cross through this membrane? Well, the answer is no. If you try to get a water-soluble hormone across this membrane, it's not going to work. So you have to have some other mechanism to get this signal across the membrane. And that's going to be what we call a transmembrane receptor. So here's a receptor right here. Now, I'm going to use some specific examples here. Um, you probably in your class don't need to know these examples specifically, but I'm just doing this to illustrate the point. So we have a receptor right here. This specific one is what's called a G-protein coupled receptor. A G-protein coupled receptor just means that we have a receptor here that's coupled to a G-protein. Okay. And so in order to get the signal from outside the cell to the inside of the cell, this hormone, which is water-soluble, has to bind to its receptor. Okay? Very important, and that forms what's called a hormone receptor complex. If the hormone is not bound to the receptor, then that target cell gets no effect. So this hormone has to be bound to its receptor. And when that happens, this G protein becomes activated. So what do we see? 
we see a hormone binding to the receptor on the outside of the cell, and then on the inside of the cell, the G protein becomes activated. And so we get some biological effect inside the cell. Let's look at one of those biological effects. Well, for example, when a hormone binds to this receptor, a G protein coupled receptor, the G protein becomes active, and it'll sort of move over here along the membrane, and it will bind to, let's say, an enzyme and activate it. This enzyme in this example is called adenylate cyclase. Depending on your course, you may actually see this enzyme several times throughout a &P. But adenylate cyclase catalyzes a reaction where ATP inside the cell is converted into this substance called cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP is what we call a second messenger. The reason it's a second messenger is because the hormone out here is the first messenger. But we can't get this hormone inside the cell because it won't cross the membrane. So what we do is we use this hormone to activate a series of proteins inside the cell that lead to an intracellular second messenger because the cyclic AMP can now exert various biological effects inside the cell. And generally, they're going to fall into one of three categories, either activating proteins or enzymes, inhibiting proteins or enzymes, or in some way altering gene expression, which occurs inside the nucleus. And the nucleus is, of course, inside the cell. So hopefully that makes sense. We can't get this water-soluble hormone in the cell, so we have to produce another molecule inside the cell to exert those functions. So this is a very indirect mechanism. Again, that hormone binds to a receptor, and that causes this protein, usually a G protein, on the inside of the cell to become active, which then activates a protein inside the cell, like adenylate cyclase, and then you get the production of an intracellular second messenger. So by doing something like this, the water-soluble hormone has no need to go inside the cell because it can transduce a signal inside the cell, like the second messenger. Okay. To illustrate that point further, let's look at a second example that you might also see. So here, let's say instead of activating adenylate cyclase, this water-soluble hormone is going to lead to the activation of a different enzyme called phospholipase C. So the hormone is going to bind to its receptor, and in the same way, we're going to activate the G protein on the inside of the cell. Okay. Again, if that hormone is not bound to the receptor, we get no G protein activation. However, when the hormone binds to the receptor, the G protein sort of moves over here along the membrane, and it binds to another enzyme and activates it. This enzyme is called phospholipase C, which catalyzes the conversion of this phospholipid, PIP2, into IP3. IP3 is also a second messenger, just like cyclic AMP was here in our first example. So IP3 can then go and exert various biological effects inside the cell, very similar to what we saw in the case of cyclic AMP. So again, we have a second messenger here because our first messenger here, the hormone, can't make it through the cell membrane. So we have to transduce that signal through the cell membrane and then create the second messenger on the inside of the cell. That's how water-soluble hormones function. And I'm not going to get into specific ones right now, but it suffice to say that pretty much all peptide hormones, protein hormones, are all water-soluble. Okay? Other examples of water-soluble hormones include epinephrine, which is involved in your fight-or-flight response. You probably talked about epinephrine uh, when you actually did the nervous system, probably back in ANP1. But they're all going to function in a similar way. Okay? Now... What if we have a lipid-soluble hormone? Okay. Now, we just mentioned that water-soluble hormones cannot cross this plasma membrane because the vast majority of the plasma membrane is lipid. Okay. So lipid-soluble hormones, can they cross the plasma membrane? Well, they're lipid-soluble. That means they're hydrophobic. They're neither charged nor polar. They're soluble in lipids. Well, if the membrane is lipid-based, then lipid-soluble hormones can cross the membrane. So lipid-soluble hormones do not need a receptor in the membrane because lipid-soluble hormones can simply just go right through the membrane. Okay? So their receptors are not in the membrane. Their receptors are in the cytoplasm. 
Okay, and their receptors are generally called nuclear receptors. Now, the reason they're called nuclear receptors is because even though they're in the cytoplasm, they will eventually go into the nucleus. Okay, so what will happen is this hormone will bind to the nuclear receptor, okay, and it will create something called a hormone receptor complex. This hormone receptor complex will basically go into the nucleus and bind to regions of the DNA. So let's say this lipid soluble hormone. One of its functions was to get more of a certain protein in this cell. Okay? The goal of this hormone is to upregulate or get more of a certain protein in this cell. So remember, proteins are encoded by the DNA inside the nucleus. So what this hormone receptor complex will do is it will bind to that region of the DNA and it will induce transcription of the DNA. And so you'll get RNA and then eventually that protein. Okay, and so you'll get more of whatever protein was needed through the action of that lipid soluble hormone. Okay, so in some respects, lipid soluble hormones are far simpler than water soluble hormones. And that's because lipid soluble hormones don't need a second messenger. They don't need a second messenger because they can directly cross the plasma membrane and get into the cytoplasm of that cell. The only thing they require is a nuclear receptor, but if that nuclear receptor is present, it'll bind to it and complex, go into the nucleus, and it will result in gene expression of that protein that it's specific for. Okay? So lipid soluble hormones cross the membrane directly, whereas our water soluble hormones have to bind to a plasma membrane receptor and then they transduce that signal through the membrane by means of this protein or this receptor and then they lead to the production of a second messenger inside the cell all because the water soluble hormone can't cross the membrane okay so hopefully this gave you a good understanding, a little bit of an intro of what hormones are, but also differentiating between these two classes of hormones, whether they be water-soluble or lipid-soluble. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In the next video, we're going to be looking at the interplay between two very important structures in the endocrine system. Those are the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland, which is divided up further. Join us then. Make sure to like and subscribe.